Hello and welcome to another brand new episode of the Modern SaaS Podcast. And this is me, your host, Yag. In today's episode, we are going to talk about mapping how businesses buy software. And to discuss that, today we have with us Carl Ferreira, the Director of Sales at Refine Labs. In fact, we at Tavoma absolutely love his points of view when it comes to SaaS buying, sales. In fact, something that I love on his profile is that he says, how you sell is actually how you win. So in fact, that is the reason why he happens to be our first external speaker or guest on our show. So with that, Carl, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here today. Yeah, yes. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. And now a little bit nervous, maybe, because I'm the first external guest. Like the bar is high. So um, I hope to uh, do the audience proud. So thanks for having me. No, absolutely. I'm excited. So, you know, when you look at this topic of um, how people buy software, especially in this sector, um, you know, first things first, let's, uh, before we even we jump into that topic, let's talk about the factors that one needs to look into or probably ask themselves before they are ready to buy. You know, uh, be- because you have been into software buying for quite a while, are there any, say, three to five pointers broadly that you say that, hey, I ask these questions myself before I say I'm ready to go out to buy? Yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. I think one of the mistakes that I see buyers make from the seller's perspective is that, you know, honestly, my discovery questions sometimes, uh, you know, uh, they don't know the answers to them, right? And that I think is like the first mistake. Like you should probably step into a conversation with a seller, request a demo, et cetera, once you at least know some of the basics, right? A couple of questions might be like, what the, can you articulate clearly, you know, the yeah. current state of things? I'm in all kinds of discovery calls all the time. And it's, uh, it's interesting sometimes how, you know, the buyer might not be able to really articulate kind of what is it that they're doing today? Let me get back to you. So it's a little bit preemptive probably uh, to be talking to a salesperson at that point. Now, I'm grateful to that for, for that, obviously, as a seller, because I can guide them through this. If you have a good salesperson, then you're going to get yeah. taken care of there. But understanding how do I navigate my own organization? This is something I've had to learn at Refine Labs. Um, you know, I can't just go buy software, right? Like, is my team going to adopt this? Yeah. Is this something that I want? Or is it something like that, that the whole team wants, right? That's important. Who needs to, you know, get this approved, et cetera. So some of those basic discovery points that a salesperson typically is asking you, have those buttoned up, have really good answers in a Google doc or something like that for those. And that will really kick off your buying process in a lot more frictionless way because you'll be in a lot more control and you won't necessarily be at the mercy kind of the salesperson to take control and kind of guide you where they may want to guide you, which may not be what's actually best for your business. So yeah. that's that's definitely where I would start as a buyer. Right, right. So um, in that journey, you know, what makes you feel that certain experiences are like, hey, this makes a lot of sense. I learned something new versus something might come across like, hey, I'm going from an SDR who is band qualifying me with those 10 typical questions. And then again, putting me forward to an A who will demo the product probably a week later. And then I may discover that it may not be useful. So what makes or breaks an experience there? Oh man, everything and anything. You know, I'm a big believer that how you sell is why you win. Every touch point there, Yag, I think matters. Everything from the website to that inbound kind of intake process, whether it's a form, how quickly I follow up, or maybe it's a tool that kind of routes to a calendar. And I encourage all of my customers and any, any, any SaaS companies that I consult or talk to, every step, everything matters at that point. Challenger actually did a study a number of years ago in, in 2019, so it's actually recent, that buyers attribute 53% of their buying um, the decision that they make, right? 53% of that influence comes from the sales experience, right? So salespeople only have a very short period of time with their buyer, right? Uh, Buyers are doing a lot of research in other places now. 
But that small piece of time that I get with Yog, with I, that I get with the buying team is outsized when it comes to influence. So every single touch point matters. The difference between a good sales experience, a good buying experience and a, and a poor one is going to be exactly that. We just haven't thought through every detail, right? We're like, ah, oh, we'll just follow up with them after they convert. And then we'll have a call with them. And yeah, we'll just let them talk to an SDR. It's like, you're already doing an enormous amount of harm there to that buying experience. And your competitor is going to very easily come in and um, take advantage of that and kind of woo the buyer away in, in another direction. Every touch point there matters. The clock is right. ticking. I take it very seriously. When, that, when you hit the website, the clock is ticking every single point matters and it needs to be taken super seriously right and especially because you're from the world of sales and you're also involved in buying does at any given point your experience as a seller come into play saying that hey this guy is doing this wrong has it ever happened sometimes i don't want to say that you know another seller is doing something wrong i definitely know how to beat them up on price and uh and get some good discounts so there's <laughs> there's some advantages <laughs> there I know all the buttons to push, right? But I think that for me, it's, it's, you know, I, I think the mistake that is made whenever I'm buying is I, I can tell that I'm treated like, like I probably don't know much about the product. I'm treated as if I'm actually much earlier in my research and discovery process than I really am. I'm really at the yeah. end of it. And really, yeah. I'd like to just purchase. I don't even need to talk to a salesperson. Like that's how mature I am in my buying process. But a lot of times a mistake that sales teams make is they like drag me back into this area where it's like they have to ask me all these questions, et cetera. This is for the seller. It's clearly for the yeah. seller and that doesn't serve me, the buyer. Um, and that's yeah. a kind of a big mistake that I see made with, um, you know, when sellers are, are kind of targeting you know, people that know how to buy. Right. So, you know, let's talk about mapping this exact experience right there in the sense like there is one point where you start with saying that, hey, today I have this problem. I want to solve this problem. And then you go through the uh, sales journey or the buyer journey. And then at one point say that out of all the softwares that I evaluated, this is the one that I want to buy. So what, what does that journey entail? And I particularly love this example that you just said, saying that you know, somebody treats me as I'm much early, though I made that uh, initial research because I understand whom I'm talking to. How do companies understand what is the kind of buyer and adapt and map those things according to the kind of buyer they're dealing with? Yeah, there's a couple of questions in there. Yeah, um, yeah. The second one was how does a how does a company map kind of their and, and design really an inbound buying experience that aligns with you know how buyers want to buy? Um, I think that the the first one is just to accept the reality that they know a whole lot more about your space. Um, that you know, ten years ago, like yeah, I, I, you you might buy a piece of software. And you didn't know anything about it. You had to talk to a salesperson to get the information about the product, right? Like there wasn't like a, tons of information everywhere. You couldn't just go into Pavilion and, and ask Yog, hey, what's your experience been like with this CRM or with Sixth Sense or with this tool or that tool, right? None of that existed. So salespeople were the gatekeepers. Well, salespeople still believe and lots of sales orgs still believe that they are the gatekeepers. Come through us. We need to handle the objections, right? Et cetera. And it's just not reality. The reality is buyers come to the table very well educated. I'll give you an example. Recently, two of my customers uh, that I sold here at Refine Labs. Hey, Carl, I noticed that you use Chili Piper on your uh, website. I gave demos of Chili Piper to two of my customers. They haven't even talked to sales yet. They, they're, they're maybe not even on the sales radar and they've already gotten demos. And I compared yeah. Chili Piper to HubSpot. That's wild, right? That could never <laughs> have happened right. 10 years ago, but that's yeah. the reality. And you see it in private Slack communities all the time. Oh yeah, hey, DM me, I'll show you this tool. Hey, how much does this cost? Hey, what's your experience with Avoma, et cetera. People do so much digging and research before they talk to sales that, yeah. That's the first thing I need to change. Okay. I don't want to belabor that yeah. point. In that inbound buying experience, the mindset has to change. People yeah. come through educated. The second thing that has to change is that 
I think a lot of buying teams, they don't go all in. They don't really think of like this as a this huge buying experience that's really, really important, right? They'll do like one thing. They'll be like, okay, well, we'll put a Calendly link on the website, right? It's not enough. It, everything needs to be thought of. If if Yag, a CMO of an awesome SaaS company, comes inbound, guess what? If I designed that inbound buying experience, Yag is skipping the line, and he's going to go talk straight to a subject matter expert. We do this at Refine mm-hmm. Labs. We have certain criteria where you might be routed to talk to a salesperson who knows a lot, or sometimes you're routed straight to a VP of marketing. I want you, Yag, to talk to someone that's a peer, right? Yeah, and so I think yeah. buyer, uh, seller, sales orgs that are designing these buying experience, they don't think outside the box. They think in kind of this linear fact, has to go to an SDR, has to go to an AE, has to go through this kind of discovery, then to a demo. And I think yeah. all of that needs to just honestly be torn down. And we need to rethink what is actually best. Uh, and sometimes it's not talking to an SDR. It's not talking to an AE. Maybe it's not talking to anybody. Just let them in the product. Yeah. Or maybe it's put them on the phone with, you know, some of the executive team or subject matter experts, et cetera. Can we be flexible here? Obviously, I could go on for days about this, but those are some initial thoughts that I have on designing and crafting a compelling and differentiating inbound buying experience. You know, this is awesome because I've also seen certain experiences where companies say that, uh, hey, in my previous company, I've used your product. I, I know what a product is all about. Now I've changed my company. Just give me a good deal and I'm ready to use. Now, if you again put them through the SDR and the typical AE process, I'm like, come on, cut chase. They are here to give you money. <laughs> Take it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let's let's flip the switch. You know, let's also talk about uh, your buying experience. When, when you're saying that this is the problem, how are you going about evaluating the tools that you want, which companies to talk to? And then from there, what are the things that make you decide that, okay, out of the five companies or products that I've shortlisted, maybe these are the final two and I'll decide between these two. Yeah, I think it goes back to how how I buy, which is probably similar to how you yeah. buy. What, what do we do first? We ask the people we trust, hey, what do you use for conversation intelligence or for CRM yeah. or for whatever, Yeah. right? So I think that's like first, right? That's first. The people I trust, my network, what do they use? Second piece is what have I used in the past? I already kind of know that. And if I've had a decent experience, then okay, you know what? I'll have a conversation with them. And then there's the opportunity. The third piece is for fresh demand to be created in my mind, right? If somebody has stood out to me in some other way, whether it's their marketing or or maybe really good sales outreach, right? I mean, we're not, I'm, not, I'm not against outbound, right? Like, is there another way uh, to get kind of a product that I hadn't used or my network isn't super familiar with onto my radar. I think those are the three ways and I'm going to distill those down into a short list, right? So the next thing I'm going to do is my own research. Hey, can I get a demo of this somewhere? Can I look at the pricing page? Are there trials? Uh, what does the website say about them? What are they different? G2, things like that, right? These are areas now where I'm going where there's I have high intent to buy. And that's where I'm, I'm beginning my journey. So I think it's always helpful to have a set of, of three to five, you know, or so five is a lot. I think three is healthy yeah. unless you just know, you know, you want something very, very specific. But I think it's healthy to evaluate um, a, a variety as these tools change really, really quickly, you know. So even if you use something a year ago, it could be totally different, you know. So that happened at HubSpot when I came, you know, I sold for HubSpot for years. Yeah. Um, that happened at HubSpot. We used to make a joke, like you haven't been in HubSpot in the last, you know, six months and you've never been in HubSpot, right? Because it's just <laughs> rapidly changing. So uh, I think that's that's where it begins for me. Right, right. So yeah, once you decide that these are the ones and then let's specifically talk the experience that you're going to have during that buyer journey. Like say you have, you've done your initial research, um, like say you you understand how this company is different based on the website G2 and also have some references from your friends. Mm -hmm. Now, ultimately there are, there are going to be some experiential factors during that, that journey that you're having with this company. And there are going to be some factors that tell you that, Hey, if these things happen, I don't want to take this up. And many times it's not going to be price. It's not going to be, uh, you know, the list of features. Uh, Sometimes it's going to be even very few things that matter could be in terms of buying experience, could be in terms of 
what exactly you majorly want to solve for so how do you go about that what what ticks you off in that journey and what says this is what it is yeah there's a lot of things that are annoying that happen and those little annoyances will build up right yeah. so for yeah. instance i'm going to go and have sometimes two totally different experiences where well, the first thing that annoys me is when i have I submit to talk to sales and then I'm in the sales process and I realize that the tool doesn't do what I want it to do. It's very annoying. It's like, I, you know, like your website should articulate like what you do, what you don't do, et cetera. I shouldn't have to talk to a person for something like really obvious. That's the first thing that's annoying. The second yeah. thing that's annoying is obviously just waiting for somebody, right? When I was purchasing a CI tool, there was a couple of very different experiences, right? There was two or three of Voma competitors that I've submitted a form and then I wait, right? Uh, it's annoying. It's I'm ready to, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about CI right now. Like, can I talk to somebody, yeah. right? Then there was the Voma experience, which was like, oh, start for free, free, free trial, like click. Oh, I don't have to talk to anybody. You know, what, one little thing that's really annoying is sometimes people offer a free trial and then they're like, a sales rep will follow up with you and get your free <laughs> trial set up. I'm like, oh God, right? That is not free trial. <laughs> yeah, that's not a free trial. That is a paid trial. I'm paying for, with time, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So and with Avoma, it was just like, boom, I was in. In 30 seconds, I was in the tool and able to explore myself. That is very valuable to me. And it's very differentiating because while... You know, there those other companies, CRMs are routing to the right rep and, yeah. and getting a notification and they're queuing up an email to go out to me to send their calendar times, et cetera. It's like I'm already 50 percent implemented with Avoma. And that spoke something to me very powerfully, because one of the things that I care a lot about as a sales leader is, is my team going to use this? I yeah. use everything. I, I would buy every SaaS tool on the planet if I could. All right. My boss, Cassidy Shield, makes fun of me, right? I just love SaaS. <laughs> I love vinyl. I love trying all the different tools. My team, not so much, right? And so it my ease of kind of onboarding into the tool in a minute or two, that was like, oh, okay. My team is going to be able to use that 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 hit a very specific priority for me. That may not be the case for every buyer, but for me, that was right. a big one that added a lot of value where the other companies were subtracting because I was annoyed, you know, and waiting, et cetera. So uh, those are some of the different experiences. And then, you know, the discovery calls. So funny. Let's go to the next stage, right? Yeah. Discovery calls, totally different. I had to have traditional discovery with the other two companies. There was no discovery with Voma. There was onboarding. It was so funny. It's totally different, right? Um, I was being onboarded. I was being helped to use the tool. I think that, a quick sub question here. Yeah. you know, when when companies say discovery, there are two aspects there. Certain companies keep you know discovery separate, demos separate. Whereas, yeah, on on our side, we believe that discovery and demo should go hand in hand. I show you certain things. And then in that process, try to understand what you're trying to solve for so that I can show you that relevant thing that helps you solve that. And then, of course, there is this complete free trial. Now, there are going to be two different sets of people, yep. like say an enterprise buyer, probably not everybody is going through the free trial. They want to schedule a demo. Yep. But from that perspective, how do you see the demo and discovery thing? You know, Do you feel that it still needs to be separated out case by case, or do you believe that it needs to go together? I think I, I think it depends, but I think it it can be done better. I don't think it has to be either or, right? Why can't I get on a call with you if you're a seller and you ask me good discovery questions? You've done good pre-call research. You know that I've done my research. Hey, Carl, like there's a ton of information out there on Avoma. What do you know so far? You know, like lead the call with that instead of exactly. leading the call with Hey, you know, what, what's your budget, you know, et cetera, like kind of, you know, banting me to death. Right. So, <laughs> like that, that, that's where it depends. Right. So on a discovery call, why not queue up a demo and be like, Hey, let me give you a quick tour. It doesn't mean that we can't have a second, more in-depth demo for a broader team, et cetera. It doesn't have to be binary. Right. Yeah. And I think that takes skill and confidence on the part of the seller to be able to just queue up a demo. And I, I, I like to say, rip it and ship it, right? I said that at HubSpot. I was just, I was like, I was the rep that was like, look, 
let's go. We'll, we'll do it right now. Why, why extend the sales process? I know what you need. I can show it to you right now. We got 10, you got 10 minutes? Like, let's just do it now. That's yeah. a mindset, I think. And it takes, you know, it takes enablement, it takes skill and takes confidence to be able to, to rip it and ship it, the demo like that. But it's, I think, a necessary evolution of the sales process because anything binary that happens in a sales process, a sales process is so dynamic, so complex, buying teams, different personalities, politics and personas, you got to be flexible if you want to win in this environment. Right. So that's what I think about it. Does a, a long discovery and then a demo on a separate call make sense sometimes? Yeah. Maybe, you know, if you're selling yeah. some some big piece of software, et cetera. Yeah. But yeah. be flexible, you know, be open. Right, right. So the first step you said, you're doing your research, getting with the ecosystem. You're looking at the software. If you're able to get hands on it quickly, that's step one. And then the step two, you spoke about discovery. So, or, or in this case, onboarding. So what would be the next thing? Well, after I'm, I mean, if some companies are still, you know, we're still like, in, you know, oh, we'll do a demo or oh, we'll do a proposal review. And they're kind of going through all these steps. So with one company, I, I'm like purchased already, basically. And one, I'm still like in their stage three. Is that so funny that salespeople will move a buyer in their stages and the buyer themselves would not agree? that that's the stage they're in. I wish there was like transparency where it's like, hey, this is the stage that I believe you're in. Do you agree? I think like 90% of the time the buyer would be like, no, I'm either way far ahead or no, I'm not, I'm way behind, you know? So anyways, an interesting kind of- uh, I love that idea. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of thought experiment to think like, does my, does my whenever I look at my pipeline, I'm like, or my team's pipeline, does like the buyer agree with you that they are at this stage? You yeah. know, it should be clear that it's a yes. And if it's a no, what's the problem? So, um, yeah, onboarding, what, what's, what's happening there? Yeah, I'm being successful now in the product. I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling, you know, I'm, my team is getting into it. One of the things that was awesome, you know, Avoma is really interesting because you all, I, I would attribute your inbound buying process largely to why you all won uh, our business because you all made a net new deal for a couple of your competitors. You turned it into a competitive deal. What I mean by that is I had no conversation intelligence software before I came inbound to three or four different companies. But because I got into yours so quickly and because I invited my team into it, I think Avoma actually like, like uses email and like automatically adds people. Yeah. yeah. We were using it. So now your competitors had to rip you out. I was it, so you added a whole nother factor where I was like, wait, I'm not even buying these other tools anymore. I'm actually like sort of a customer already of a Voma. I'm using this. I have to undo what I've done if I want to go to another, if I want to buy from, you know, a, a, another tool. That is serious friction for me. I'm not going to do that. That's amazing that Avoma does that, right? It brings me into the product and now turns a net new opportunity for the other companies into a competitive ripout, which is a totally different game that they are not prepared for, right? Yeah. And so that I think is is just a fascinating uh, idea to begin with, and something that you know a, a more of a product led approach can, it can be very dangerous if you know the product is is ready for that so right that's amazing thank you so much for that kind words yeah that's that's interestingly a lot of learning there for us um you know i personally never looked at it from the perspective of making it a competitive deal that to me is a net new perspective and something i'm going to definitely take away from this conversation is you know definitely entertaining this idea of seeing if we can make that uh transparency level out saying if you agree that you're on that stage because that's 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 really amazing right so I, when you think about it it's an internal conversation we never really assume or think that hey is the prospect also feeling the same thing if they had their own deal stages or buying stages would they say that they're in demo stage or proposal stage or legal like the last stage uh, I think a lot of times the answer is no, they wouldn't, you know, and that's why you lose deals, right? That's why we lose deals to no decision because we missed something. We thought 
the buyer was at a buying stage that in reality they were not. Uh, and so, yeah, it'd be awesome to, to, yeah, I don't know what tool would do that, but to match them up, that'd be really cool research. Like how, what percentage of the time is a sales rep right? And I would say that it's probably less than 30%, right? Because close rates on average are 25 to 30%. So they're not right very often. I'm not right very often. And so it's just a fascinating kind of study of, uh, you know, buying psychology, et cetera. So. Right. So one of the reasons for us this internally changed is because, you know, traditionally I've seen two different kinds of sales conversations. One, typically you have people saying that, hey, you know what, if we have X number of value in our pipeline and our uh, conversion that is close rate is about roughly 30 to 40 percent of it, then if we if we want to make sure that we are hitting about 500K or 1 million per month, we need 3X of that pipeline. And to me, when I came into OMA, the first thing that changed in that process was to say that, hey, we are a small company at this point, you know, we cannot afford to burn those bridges. The idea is why can't we fix the leaky bucket first? Instead of doing 3x, mm. you can have 2x, but improve the conversion. Whatever is missing, let's do that. Yep. And and that's when, you know, when I first saw your profile and where it clearly said, how you sell is how you win. Yep. I was like, Wow, this is this is a person who gets it, who talks about it day in, day out. So where did that first come from? Did you have this right from your HubSpot times? Yeah, it was from HubSpot. You know, actually, I, I actually adapted it from Brian Halligan because he used to always say, like, how you build is why you win. He always said that on all hands calls, right? Because a big differentiator of HubSpot is that it's not cobbled together, uh, you know, acquisitions, right? Our big competitor was Salesforce. So one of yeah. our major value propositions was, like and very much like apples, right? Like we build these this tech. So his angle was, you know, how you build is why you win, right? And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I was playing around with kind of this phrase, and I was like, that's so true for sales. And then I totally stole it, ripped it off, changed it, and <laughs> said, how you sell is why you win. And again, there's a bunch of research to back that up. And man, it's so true, right? In my experience, you can take. Um, a buyer who is just evaluating you because they need a third vendor and they are already in their minds and a good set in their minds, they already are going with somebody else. A yeah. good seller can bring it in that sales process and show and change that person's mind for the better, right? And show them a better way, potentially. Like that's the power of, you know, just a really powerful sales process and taking every inch of it very, very seriously from follow-up emails to, you know, your outbound to your, how accessible are, are you, you know, to obviously the contents of your calls, who you're talking to, et cetera, everything matters and it really moves the needle. You know, this, this gives me a very interesting question in my head as you speak, because, you know, when you competed directly with um, Salesforce back in the day, the, the, Quick outlook towards HubSpot is that it's for SMB and Salesforce is for enterprise. And when, though HubSpot can still serve the enterprise market quite well, there is this mindset where people begin to, you know, call themselves to graduate from HubSpot to Salesforce. Yep. And when that happens, as a salesperson, how did you tackle that situation? Did you ever come through that? Yeah, I mean, like almost every deal is against Salesforce. Yeah. So like if you're a seller at HubSpot, like you are a competitive type of salesperson in the sense that you, you're you never just selling something alone, rarely. There's yeah. always a whole yeah. bunch of people. So you get very comfortable in those spaces. Um, if you're not selling net new CRM, you, you're doing a Salesforce rip out. Right. So, uh, so again, it's a very difficult and challenging sales environment there. You're all, you have to, there's some world class sellers there. Yeah. But how I handled that, I mean, proof, proof. Let me show you. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? You like HubSpot can't handle this. Let me show you. Oh, by the way, I loved saying this in my demos. By the way, a salesperson is doing the demo right now because at Salesforce, like salespeople don't really do demos. They get solutions engineers for every single, different system. A big thing I used to do is, by the way, me, I'm a normal person like you doing this demo, I'll show this to you. So I think in those instances, it was landing the plane in the sense of you, what is it that you're afraid that HubSpot can't do? I'll show you right now and show you that you won't need admins and developers. We'll do it together right now. I'll set you up a trial. I'll do it in your portal. You know, when you could put your money where your mouth is like that, 
that closes deals. I lost, yeah. I don't want to brag right now. I don't even know if I've ever said this publicly. I've lost the sales force. I lost the sales force head to head one time in October of 2020. It was a manufacturing company. I'll probably never forget it, but one time. So it, we won a lot against Salesforce. And a lot of the reason was because I could show you, you know, any myths I could debunk with reality, right? And I could show it to you that that that, that wasn't true. That, that was just good marketing from Salesforce, you know, good competitive intelligence from their end, right? So anyways. No, that's amazing. I absolutely love this. So for all the people who are probably listening to us or watching this today, you know, if we have to distill this entire buyer experience into, say, probably a framework or three or four factors that, hey, this is what a good buyer experience or a great buyer experience is all about. What would be those factors if we can sum it up together? Man, yeah, that's a big question there. You want us to build a <laughs> framework on the fly right now. Uh, cool. I mean, you spoke about all of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I would distill it into three things, right? I think okay. it's uh, mindset, measurement, and execution. I think the first step is think differently about your buyer. They're much more educated. They've probably already seen a demo. They know how much you cost. That is going to change how it is that you approach them. So change your mind about the inbound buying experience and change your mind about how, you know, how educated uh, your buyers are coming into you, much more educated than they were just even a few years ago. The second thing is measurement. I always tell my customers, the CRM never lies. Look in your CRM. Where are you dropping the ball? What are, like, understand the math of your pipeline, which the time between deal stages, understand that. Speed to meeting. Understand the math of all this and break each piece of it down, right? Have it measurable. So mindset, measurement, and then execution, right? Taking the learnings kind of from those first two points and meticulously executing and crafting um, the sales process that, that, that makes sense for your buyer and that increases your likelihood uh, that, that you win deals, right? Good fit deals. And that execution can be a lot of things. It could be you know, operational, right? Your CRM, et cetera, maybe getting something like Chili Piper. It can also be the right hires. Sometimes like you just don't have the right, the right salespeople for this new inbound buying experience, right? And so, and, and then the right measurement, right? Making sure that you and the C-suite are aligned. Hey, our measurement's going to change. We're going to experiment in some new ways on the discovery call with a calendar link, with allowing SMEs to come onto sales calls skipping the SDRs in some respects, right? Be experimental here with some of these things in your execution and continue to measure. And um, 100% of the time, you're going to see the, the needle move. So that's that's my framework on the fly there. Mindset, measurement, execution. Hopefully that was helpful. No, this is amazing because, you know, in fact, when I go back in my memory to this entire conversation that we had so far, I think Entire thing sums up into these three pillars, right? You speak about the buyer experience, then it's it's going to be part of your execution. The measurement, you know where exactly you're going wrong. Yep. And also the discussion related to uh, uh, HubSpot or also, you know, making a deal a competitive thing. That's all part of the mindset thing as well. Yep, so 100%. It's, it's, like, it's like, wow, you know, you can crystallize this in like less than one minute. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Well, thanks. I appreciate the compliment. You know, you definitely squeezed me to to find a framework there in the last 30 seconds or so. So uh, I appreciate you. No, this is awesome. And I think we kind of covered quite a lot over the last 30, 35 minutes or so. And um, so I, any any last minute thoughts that we probably have not covered in, in the topic of uh, mapping buyer experience? Man, I think that was a good start, Yog. Maybe we think on it and do part two. Yeah, you know, soon. But yeah, I think that was a really powerful start. And man, you know, buying teams that start there, I think uh, really, you know, stand a lot better chance of being more competitive and differentiating in super crowded markets uh, that we all exist in and try to thrive in. So yeah, I think we're good to go. I appreciate you having me. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, once again, very proud that uh, we had one of our top favorites to be the first guest on the show. And this is amazing. I, I learned a lot and I'm going to go back and probably listen to this a couple of more times uh, to get the most out of it. Probably convert this into a blog post to distill the best possible information out of this. Love it. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Yag. All right, then. So for all the listeners out there, that's that from us in this episode. And uh, until we connect with you with another guest and another topic in the next one, this is Bright from us. Have a good day and take care. Oh, 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 oh,